Hi, this is Ed Ritiger, and once again, I am delighted you're tuning in to hear another one of my sermons. Now, I'm preaching this on January 8th. Uh, as we're entering a new year, we just finished one series of focused on characters of Christmas, and next week we're going to be starting a new series about spiritual growth. Uh, but today we're going to have a focus on baptism. And, of course, I'm preaching this in my church in Sligo, Pennsylvania. Now, Sligo Presbyterian is a, it's a small congregation in a small town in northwestern Pennsylvania. It's about 10 miles south of Clarion, right off of Interstate 80. So, listen for the Word of God. As you all might remember, last week we finished up a series of sermons dealing with some of the characters who sort of found their way into the story of Christmas. And the last of these folks were the wise men, who, according to Matthew, followed a star from the east and were led to Bethlehem. And there they presented their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, do you all remember that? Well, the day on which Christians have traditionally celebrated the coming of the wise men, or the kings, or probably better, uh, the uh, Magi, is called Epiphany. Now, it's always on January 6th, which, by the way, is the 12th day after Christmas. And, of course, that means that um, on Friday, Debbie received 12 drummers drumming, 11, 11 pipers piping, 10 lords of leaping, line ladies dancing, 8 maids of milking, 7 swans of swimming, 6 geese of laying, 5 golden rings, 4 calling birds, 3 French hens, 2 turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree, and boy, was she surprised. Now, that was Epiphany. And traditionally, on the Sunday right after these 12 days, we remember the baptism of Jesus Christ as described by Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or as described by John the Baptist in the Gospel of John. Of course, this fact, this fact makes the baptismal story pretty special, because it's one of only a handful about Jesus found in all four Gospels. I mean, the birth of Jesus is only found in two, the transfiguration only in three, and the epiphany and the ascension only in one. But not the story of the baptism. It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And even though it's not exactly the same in each, they all involve Jesus being baptized. And then as he's coming out of the water, there's a voice from heaven announcing that he is God's beloved son. Now, that's the story in a nutshell, one that I imagine you all have heard before. And for that reason, this morning, we're going to change it up a little bit. Because instead of talking about what happened to Jesus in the Jordan, we're going to talk about what happens to us when we're baptized. In other words, we're going to look at the meaning of baptism. And I think that's a pretty good thing to do because I believe a lot of Christians are a little bit fuzzy about what this baptism business is all about. I mean, even though it's one of the few things that all churches agree is important, we definitely don't all agree about what it signifies or how to do it. And I'll tell you, maybe that's the reason most Christians really don't understand what baptism means. And so that's what we're going to do, we're going to look at this morning. What is baptism for a believer living around Sligo, Pennsylvania on January 8th in the year of our Lord, 2023? And to shape our discussion, we're going to use something that the great 5th century theologian, Augustine, said about sacraments, which includes baptism. He wrote that a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. You see, we're going to use these words to sort of guide our discussion. Now, that's what we're going to do. But, you know, before talking about what baptism is, I think it's important to spend at least a few minutes talking about three things that it's not, at least not according to my reading of the Bible. And I'll tell you, I believe that's particularly important because it seems as though every church has a slightly different take on baptism. But in my opinion, not all these interpretations are biblical. For example, first, I don't think the Bible says that baptism is necessary for salvation. I remember back when I was in my church out in Montana, I had a couple tell me that before they got their children baptized, 
his mother was driving him crazy. You know, saying things like, I don't know how you can sleep at night knowing your girls haven't been baptized. You see, she thought her granddaughters were lost eternally before their baptism. But I don't see that in Scripture. In fact, wouldn't something like that limit God's freedom and love? I mean, wouldn't it run counter what Jesus himself had in mind when he said, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep and they know me? Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I, and I give up my life for my sheep. I have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them together too when they hear my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. Frankly, I don't think baptism can limit the freedom and love of God. Just like second, I also don't believe baptism is all about our decision to repent and confess. Now, granted, that's the kind of baptism offered by John the Baptist. Something that he did, and this is, this is important to remember, he did to prepare people for the coming of Christ. But right now, we don't need to prepare for the coming because Jesus has already come. In fact, he's lived and died and was raised and ascended. And with his coming, the meaning of baptism change. And that's what I think Paul was getting at when he said this to some people in the city of Corinth, who'd only received John's baptism. Paul replied, John baptized people so that they can turn to God, but he also told them that someone else was coming and that they should put their faith in him. Jesus is the one that John was talking about. After people heard Paul say this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, I don't think baptism is all about something we choose to do. And I'll tell you something else. I don't think baptism is a ritual with all these specific rules that you have to follow and words that you have to say. You see, for me, that's the third thing it's not. For example, some people see the amount of water used as a huge deal, as though it's uh, not a real baptism if you haven't been totally immersed. And some say a church baptism is somehow better or maybe worse than one in a, in a stream or in a swimming pool. And I've, I've known folks who've, who debate the exact words that must be used. You know, like baptism involves reciting some kind of magic formula. Now that's what some seem to say. But you know, when you look closer at these rules, these, these laws... Well, generally, we've created them ourselves. But that hasn't stopped us from using them to separate one church from another and divide Christians into little franchises. That's what has happened. In fact, it's like we've completely forgotten that the Apostle Paul wrote this to the Galatians. My friends, you were chosen to be free. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do anything you want. Use it as an opportunity to serve each other with love. All that the law says can be summed up in the command to love others as much as you love yourselves. But if you keep attacking each other like wild animals, you had better watch out or you will destroy yourselves. And so in my opinion, I think the Bible is pretty clear about what baptism is not. It's not necessary for salvation, and it's not about our decision to repent and confess, and it's not this rule burden ritual we have to follow. No, I believe baptism is something else. In fact, again, using the words of Augustine, I believe baptism is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. But let's unpack that a little bit, starting with the second half of the statement. You see, first, like Augustine, I believe baptism involves an inward and invisible grace. Which means that for us to understand what baptism is, we really need to get a handle on grace. You know, what it means and what it does. And I'll tell you, I don't think there's a better definition of what grace is than the one that Paul offered to the Ephesians. But God was merciful. We were dead because of our sins, but God loved us so much he made us alive with Christ, and God's gift of undeserved grace is what saves you. God raised us from death to life with Christ Jesus, and he has given us a place beside Christ in heaven. 
God did this so that in the future world, he could show how truly good and kind he is to us because of what Christ Jesus has done. You were saved by faith in God who treats us much better than we deserve. This is God's gift to you and not anything you've done on your own. It isn't something you have earned, so there is nothing you can brag about. You see, grace isn't a wage. It isn't a commodity that we have to earn or deserve. I mean, if it were, then it would be the result of something we've done or or said or promised. Therefore, having done enough, we have every reason to brag. But that's not grace. Instead, grace is a gift freely given by the one who chose to love us, who chose to love you and me before he laid the foundation of the universe. And the grace he's given to us, and he's given it to us without our permission or help, well, it becomes effective, you know, meaningful when we trust that the gift has been given. You see, that's what grace is. And when we trust that it's real, when we have faith that With the coming of Jesus Christ, the Word became a human being and lived here with us. And when we decide to believe that Paul was right on the mark when he said this to the Romans, God treats everyone alike. He accepts people only because they have faith in, in Jesus Christ. All of us have sinned and fall short of God's glory. But God treats us much better than we deserve. Because of Christ Jesus, he freely accepts us and sets us free from our sins. When this is what we trust, man, we change. The past no longer becomes an anchor, and suddenly we're able to respond to God. As a matter of fact, Paul even used baptism to show how we're changed by God's grace. Just listen. Don't you know that all who share in Christ Jesus by being baptized also share in his death? When we were baptized, we died and and were buried with Christ. We were baptized so that we could live a new life as Christ was raised to life by the glory of God the Father. If we shared in Jesus' death by being baptized, we will be raised to life with him. We know that the persons we used to be were nailed to the cross with Jesus. This was done so that our sinful bodies would no longer be slaves of sin. We know that sin doesn't have power over dead people. Now, that's what Paul wrote, and that's exactly what our baptism represents. It's a gift from God. Therefore, it involves an inward and invisible grace. That's one, but that's not all. Because again, according to Augustine, the sacrament itself becomes an outward invisible sign of that grace. And that's the second thing that I believe is true of baptism. You see, whether the water is poured or sprinkled, whether we're in a church or in a pool, or whether we're recognizing God's grace ourselves or claiming it on behalf of our children, baptism shows the world who we are. It provides for us an identity. Let me explain. It's through our baptism that we celebrate the fact that we're part of a new family, a a new people, one that's different from anything we see in the world. For example, while the world says that people should be divided and we should be leery and even scared of folks who aren't like us, our perspective on the world is different. It's like Paul wrote to the the Corinthians. The body of Christ has many different parts, just as any other body does. Some of us are Jews and others are Gentiles. Some of us are slaves and others are free. But God's Spirit baptized each of us and made us part of the body of Christ. Now we each drink from the same Spirit. You see, that's different. And while the world teaches that although people are equal, everyone is equal, it's just that some are more equal than others, our view of one another is different. Just listen to what Paul wrote to the Galatians. All of you are God's children because of your faith in Christ Jesus. And when you were baptized, it was as though you had put on Christ in the same way you put on new clothes. Faith in Christ is what makes each of you equal with each other. 
whether you are a Jew or a Greek, a slave or a free person, a man or a woman. So if you belong to Christ, you are now part of Abraham's family and you will be given what God has promised. You see, that's another difference. And while the world tells us to do whatever we need to do in order to, to come out on top, to come out first, our mission as baptized Christians is different. It's like when at the be- end of, of Matthew's gospel, Jesus came to the 11 disciples and said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to do everything I told you. And I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. Now, that's what Jesus said. And I'll tell you, I find it interesting that he told them and he tells us that the first step in making disciples isn't teaching, but baptizing. In other words, we're called to pass on to others that outward and visible sign of that inward and invisible grace. And to me, that's exactly what baptism means. You see, it doesn't force God to save us. And it isn't about us doing something for ourselves. And it sure isn't a ritual that must be done one way or it's the highway. No, as Augustine said about sacraments, it's, it really is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. And you know, maybe if we sort of claim this understanding, not only will our awareness and relationship with God grow, but so might the possibility of greater unity within the body of Christ. Amen. Well, I am delighted you listened to the sermon. I hope you found it meaningful. Of course, if you're ever around Sligo, Pennsylvania, again, that's a little town about 10 miles south of Clarion, right off of Interstate uh, 80. If you're around Sligo Presbyterian Church on a Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, come on by and worship with us. I think you'll find it meaningful and you'll have a good time. Of course, if you're around here, if you're in the neighborhood on Wednesday morning, 1030, we have a Bible study. You're certainly invited to come to that as well. And so until I have the opportunity to talk with you in the future, I want you to remember that you, my friend, you are a child of God and God loves you very much. Goodbye for now.